at home. We used to get together in person, but now not so much. But we wanted to make sure that we still reached out to all of you and gave you the information that you needed. Before we bring on the guest, I want to ask you to head over to NAMITN.org and sign up for our email list. We send out at least one a week with curated content. It's called NAMI at Home, and it's really, really cool. And of course, you'll also find out about very, very cool stuff like the Facebook Lives. So please head over to NAMITN.org and sign up. All right, without further ado, we'd like to bring on our guest. Dr. Rosenberg, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Well, Dr. Rosenberg, I, I always go back and forth about whether or not I should read people's bios or just let them introduce themselves, but I've decided that I'm pretty sure you know you better than I know you. Uh, Tell the folks who you are. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a filmmaker. I'm an author. I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I'm with Cornell Weill Medical College here in New York City. And how did you get started as a, my, my spotlight has died. There we go. How did you get started? Because you started off as a psychiatrist. I, I think for I many people that track, right. That's my job. Oh, you're still a practicing psychiatrist. Every hour on Zoom. Awesome. I'm going to extend you a bill for this session. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, is, that is very reasonable, um, but, but please don't do that. Yeah, let's get a bill. <laughs> but in addition to being a psychiatrist, which many people understand, you know, I, I don't need to say, hey, why did you become a psychiatrist? I, I think most people understand how people pick their jobs. That, that makes sense to people. But in addition to being a psychiatrist, you're, you, you're a frontline advocate and you made a very cool documentary that was a Sundance selection. It's, it's on the screen right there. Check it out afterward. Uh, that, that's the unusual part. What prompted that move into frontline advocacy and the creation of the documentary? Well, documentary filming is something I've done since medical school. When I, I went to medical school to become a psychiatrist. My sister, as you know from my book, from my film, had, uh, had schizophrenia in Europe and unfortunately died from schizophrenia. But I decided in medical school, there wasn't a lot of psychiatry in medical school for me, for my taste. Uh, one summer, I was going to do what I always did, which is like do some research. I was going to cut up some rat brains, that sort of thing. But in the said, instead, I decided to take film courses at NYU, and and I did that throughout medical school, and that became a very passion of mine. And frankly, uh, documentary filmmaking was closer to psychiatry than most of medicine was, at least in the first two years of medical school. So, and I, I made films about schizophrenia, made films about delirium, made films that, that would educate uh, my profession at the time. And then ultimately, by the end of medical school, I was making films that would be shown mm -hmm. to the public, would be, you know, showed on PBS. Uh, during my fellowship at Cornell, uh, I, we, we had a, a film we made with NAMI, with the local NAMI chapter. And that film won NAMI, we're very proud of it. And then, I, and then after medical school uh, and after my fellowship, in addiction psychiatry, then I made films for HBO, made four films for HBO. So it's always been kind of like my night job. And uh, this film was different, this film Bedlam, because I never really told the story of serious mental illness as, in as much depth. I did make a film at Harvard at Mass General where we did follow people with very serious mental illness, but it really wasn't until this film that I decided that I would do something about my sister, about my family, about my own story. And that was really a change of heart um, to really get into that. But uh, filmmaking, writing um, has always been kind of you know part of my life. And as I you know said, it's um, as much of as anything, as much as being a psychiatrist. You know, I think that what I do as a psychiatrist, I listen to people's stories and try to make sense out of it. And you know, as a filmmaker, that's precisely what I do. Do you get good responses from your films? I, I... And I, I know you wouldn't keep making them if you don't. So, but uh, obviously they're good. But what kind of response do you get when you when you talk to the audience afterward? Yeah, um, usually they're very very good responses. I mean, yes, you know, uh, uh, the first one I made for HBO was on the Oscar shortlist, so obviously that went well. Um, the uh, you know uh, uh, audiences have really responded well. You know, and I, think, I, I really feel the audience that I am most interested in are the families. Really, people like, you know, the viewers, hopefully here, 
uh, on on this Facebook Live. Um, that's really the fam the family that I want to address in my film because I know as a family member that that all illnesses, particularly psychiatric illnesses, are very family oriented illnesses. The burden for psychiatric illness, in particular, and neurological illnesses to a lesser extent, falls squarely on the family, uh, and we pick up the pieces. So I really want the films to help give agency and mobilize family members and family members, as you know, NAMI in particular has been just kind of incredible in responding to us, helping us out. We presented the film early to the board of directors, national board of directors, Dan Gelfin, um, you know, and the whole crew there in the NAMI national office have been just really stupendously helpful and they've become friends. And and now friends with NAMI, Tennessee, honestly, we, you know, we're, I think this is the third screening event or you know, discussion we've had with NAMI Tennessee, and uh, it's also been you know, really quite wonderful. Well, we, we can't thank you enough for agreeing to be here. We're, it's awesome work that you do. Now, it, so this is sort of one of those questions that I'm asking both for you to answer both as a psychiatrist and a filmmaker, because I, I imagine that they, they differ a little. A lot of psychiatrists feel that because of HIPAA laws and because of you know patient confidentiality, that look, m my relationship as a psychiatrist is between me and my patient, everybody else go away. Now you've just said as a filmmaker, you, you know, the, the family members are very impacted and, and they're, they're very important to recovery. Now speaking as somebody who lives with bipolar disorder, I, I, I can't disagree with that. If I didn't have a strong support system, I wouldn't be here today. But your 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 medical colleagues, <laughs> they they there's no consensus. What is that like for you? You're kind of straddling the line. Well, not really, because I, I, I exist in two spheres. I exist as a journalist and I exist as a psychiatrist. I never, ever, ever ask my own patients to be in a film because I have a therapeutic relationship with them. And when I ask people to be in a film uh, that's about psychiatric patients, I'm very, very careful to never confuse myself as their doctor. In fact, in this film I made in the emergency room, we had uh, the, the hospital approach the patients first and said, do you want to talk to this film team from HBO? Uh, that's, that was who commissioned the film originally. And, um, and then they would talk not to me, but to a social worker who worked for our team because I look like an uh, older white doctor, you know, I fit, I fit central casting pretty well for a psychiatrist. I didn't want people in the emergency room to at all confuse me with their psychiatrist to think that I was taking care of them. So, you know, I go to great lengths to make sure that, um, that we do abide by you know, the rules and regulations. So again, with my patients, I never ask them to do anything more than you know, show up to sessions and, you know, be a patient. Uh, when I'm a filmmaker, when I'm a journalist, it's, it's a very, very different matter. Ken, thank you so much. There's, uh, the audience is asking us if we can speak a little louder, not me so much. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I'm sorry, but the, I don't have microphone Bibles. I will get closer. So. <laughs> not a problem. I, I, I always chuckle. Nobody has ever asked me to speak louder. So I'm, I'm, they, they, they literally said here, Gabe, fine guest, guest iffy. Uh, so just to pass that along, uh, the, uh, the next question that I have for you is it, it isn't that tough though? I, I mean, listen, I want to be very clear. I'm not a doctor. I have zero medical training, like like literally zero. Uh, but I know a lot about mental health. I know a lot about living with bipolar disorder. I, I am a subject matter expert, which is a fancy term for have no degrees and nobody should listen to me. But every now and again, I get an email from somebody and they'll describe something to me. And I, I think in my mind, that's that's not right. That's that's not right. I'm, I'm, and uh, I, as a peer specialist, I, I, I say stuff like, I think you need to have a conversation with your doctor because I, I feel very strongly that I have zero agency in, in, in that role. And I don't, I don't want to get between that. But what do you do if you're making a documentary and, and you feel that the, the medical side or the hospital side or the, the psychiatrist is, is doing something Absolutely. Great question. wrong? 
Oh, it's 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 very hard. Yeah, look, um, Takashi and Kicker is very fallible. All that all medicine is, but Takashi perhaps the most fallible. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity as a journalist to be an advocate journalist, to be able to work with the subject or the patient, if you will, and not work with them as a psychiatrist, not work within the boundaries or confines of the psychiatric relationship, which is how I work every day, but work with them as a journalist and say, hey, you know, um, we're going to help you get into this hospital and I need to talk to your family and talk to the family and, and that sort of thing. And um, on a regular basis, I call the people, the subjects in my film. My patients, I call when they set up appointments and when they call me. I mean, I respect that's a certain boundaries, a certain way of dealing with it. But as a journalist advocate, it's kind of refreshing because I could be, say things and be in people's lives and also share my own life in a way that I wouldn't with my own patients. So is it hard? It really isn't hard at all. It's actually quite refreshing. Because, you know, you've seen many psychiatrists, there's a certain kind of stance that psychiatrists take with their patients. I try not to take those with my patients. But certainly when I'm free from the therapeutic uh, connection, I could be more a friend. And I could call them now for the they call me. But it's a, it's a nice relationship. And, and all the people in the film, frankly, um, the exception of Todd, I can't find, and I fear the worst for him, frankly. But all the people in the film, except for Todd, I'm in regular contact with every few months, at least. I will, you know, dial them up or they'll dial me up or Facebook friends, you know. I'm not <laughs> friends with my patients. That wouldn't be appropriate. So it's, uh, you know, the, the, the journalist relationship with the subject is, is a wonderful one. I think for anyone to experience, you know, if you know I'm kind of like an advocate journalist, I don't see myself as impartial. I want to be impartial in, in filming something and capturing something, writing about something, but I'm not impartial about people needing treatment and needing dignity and needing the best they can get. So we've, we've talked a lot about the, the positivity. I mean, it, the Bedlam, it's, a, it's an official Sundance selection from 2019, which is, that, that's incredibly difficult. I, I think maybe people who don't follow documentaries don't realize that this is like being nominated for an Academy Award. This is, this is no small feat. So we know you get lots of praise. Can you talk to us about some of the criticism? Uh, the criticism. Look, I think that some of the criticism of the film, you know, the film can't be everything. I've, I've heard from people that, um, you know, why can't we show something that's near and dear to your heart, Gabe? You know, peer counseling. Um, you know, I would have loved to have shown that. Why don't we show more psychotherapy and less medication, uh, you know, emphasis? Um, you know, why don't we show uh, people in community mental health centers, which I strongly believe of, and then community care? You know, um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is we started in the, in the psych emergency room. But the second reason is I went where the patients took me. I know that people with serious mental illness are criminalized, but I never imagined that I would follow people and two of them I would end up following and sometimes filming in jail. Never imagined that. Uh, they took me to the jail. I didn't say, oh, I want to find someone who's going to be in jail. The patient took me there. I never imagined that we would follow someone like Patrice Colors, who we absolutely met by accident in the emergency room. Patrice said, you know, she, I, you could film me and my brother uh, from the time that he was in the emergency room. We followed him for years. And within the first year, Patrice did something, you know, really quite monumental. She, she co-founded Black Lives Matter. That's not something I would have predicted, but I think wow. we have the beauty and organicity of documentary filmmaking. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of very beautiful. You know, you follow a story and you go where the story takes you. So I think the film is um, imperfect as shortcomings doesn't, isn't everything for everybody, but I think it does capture an experience of people's serious mental illness in the emergency room, in the jails, in the courts, and captures an experience of activism in which actually we showed and we were part of, you know, changing the law in Los Angeles in LA County. Um, and that's, you know, I'm glad we were able to do that. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not everything. And I guess the other, not criticism, but I think problem with the film is, is brutal. You know, it's very, very hard to watch. 
And wherever I present it, wherever I present it, I always say, listen, this is a tough film to watch. If you need to hold someone's hand, if you need to leave, you know, that's totally cool. Don't be embarrassed. Don't think twice. Because for a lot of people, it really triggers them about the sort of horror for some people of getting, you know, psychiatric care in, a, in an emergency room and the horrors of, you know, and, and I'm a, I'm, I love psychiatry, I love what we do, but there are some horrific things that happen in the course of having a serious mental illness and we don't shy away from those in the film. So I think that's a challenging thing. I think the film is a very challenging one to watch. And, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased with the reception. We were the number one watched show on our screen, PBS's Independent Lens. We were one of 14,000 films that, you know, that were selected for uh, Sundance, 14,000 submitted, only 15 in the documentary category. But I think that, you know, all in all, it's still a hard film to watch. Um, but I would say a necessary film to watch because it tells the truth about what it means to have serious mental illness for some people in this country. In, in, in some scenes, it, I, you know, the hospitals don't come out so great. It, it, it's, it's a very, very scary place. Now, I, I have been inpatient and it, it is scary and it's traumatizing. And, and I, I wanna be very clear, I, I needed to be there. It was the best thing that happened to me and, you know, being committed saved my life. I, I've, I've watched excerpts of your film and I think, okay, well, how can anybody watch this and think this is a good thing? Like, aren't we ready to shut it all down? I, I know that that's not the answer, but that's like you said, it, it's triggering, it's jarring. How have the hospitals taken it? Are, hmm. are they question. not angry? <laughs> a great question. Listen, I see some of your, your, your viewers are not hearing me, so I'm gonna plug in my microphone. Okay. And we'll see if that makes things better. Okay, Thank on. you. <laughs> well, we do that, I'll dance. Okay. <laughs> I think we're making progress because the feedback is louder. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for bearing with us. Uh, we're going to see. We're going to see if this works. Is this any better? That is excellent. You okay, are so I'm going to hold this in my mouth, <laughs> and uh, hopefully that will either I, I'll swallow the microphone or I'll you'll be able to hear me better. So that's great. Thank so I'm you. Sorry, Gabe. You were saying. So, the, uh, how has the response from the hospitals been? Because I I can I the, the hospitals don't come off so well. <laughs> right. Um. You, you can still hear me, right? Yep. Okay, just because now I can hardly hear you, but it's okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. The hospital has really embraced the film. In fact, the Department of Mental Health in Los Angeles has insisted upon using the film and showing the film, and they wanted to be the first to premiere the film in Los Angeles. They um, showed the film several times, but for the first time, they rented out the 550 seat Paramount Theater in Los Angeles in the Paramount lot and filled every seat. And, uh, you know, and, and the, the, the director of DMH, Department of Mental Health in Los Angeles, could not have been more grateful. You know, I, when I showed them the film at the first time, you know, before we, before we you know, finally cut the film, we had a responsibility to show it to them, not so they can edit it, so, but that so they could at least, we could hear their grievances. And the head of the Department of Mental Health, John Sharon, stood up and said, I have to leave early. And I was like, oh, this is really gonna be terrible. They're gonna give me a hard time. And he just hugged me and said, this is just amazing. This is our story. This is what we go through. This is what we need to change. And, uh, you know, it really gives you faith in people in general. Um, we showed the film at the American Psychiatric Association. We showed it there uh, once and we'll show it there again at, an, at another meeting. And you know, the film is also very critical of psychiatrists, especially in the past, what they have failed to do to take care of people with serious mental illness. However, they too have embraced the film. They can't say enough good about it. They've 
have two presidential symposiums. These are symposiums sponsored by the uh, current presidents. Two presidents of the American Psychiatric Association have supported and asked for those symposium, special uh, screenings of Bedlam for the, the association. So I think that, you know, they're the same way as the Department of Mental Health in Los Angeles, who, you know, who runs the uh, department that, that we film. Um, they say, you know, we need to make this better and we want to make it better. And um, yeah, I'm kind of blown away by their response. It's just, you know, that and the response from NAMI means so much to me, honestly. Are they improving or not, not they, I, I mean, I, actually, yes. Are, are they in particular improving? Is, are things improving? What's the, what's happened since the film came out? Well, so you see at the end of the film, they stopped the building of a 4,000 bed jail. Now that's really quite something, you know, because we we now put people in jail. You're 10 times more likely to be in jail than a hospital in many states if you have a mental illness. And they were gonna build yet a bigger jail in Los Angeles. But the activists and the Department of Mental Health stopped the building of that jail. And they're trying to concentrate on more humane treatments, community-based treatments. Um, and there just was, with our help, I might add, something passed called Measure J in Los Angeles County, which is a substantial amount of money going for community care and community mental health efforts. Um, so things are changing. They're trying to adopt a model, all kinds of models. I mean, they can't do you know, everything and change it overnight. It's an incredibly large and complicated system, but they're trying to use a model from a town called Trieste, Italy. Trieste, Italy is as you may know from my book, uh, it's a World Health Organization exemplar for really good community mental health, 24-7 community mental health workers. And they are, you know, trying to do that in Los Angeles. So, yeah, I think things have changed. I think that's why uh, DMH and HS, uh, uh, the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Health Services in general in Los Angeles have both enthusiastically supported the film because they want you know, Los Angeles to not be an epicenter of the crisis, but to be an epicenter of change. And I think that with the film, uh, that is indeed happening. It, it's a little bit sad that you had to, actually it's a lot sad that the example that you had, you, you had to leave America. Like you went, you went all the way to Italy and you're like, hey, they're doing it right. Is there any place in America that is doing this right? And I, you, you may not know the answer to that question. It's just, it's just yeah, I'm, I mean, I think various places are doing it right. Look, it's a very complex problem. Uh, one of the reasons why they're doing it right in Italy is because they have things that we don't have. Uh, and they don't have things that we do have. For instance, they don't have a drug epidemic. And uh, drugs really complicate so much the treatment and care of people with serious mental illness. They have intact families, which we often don't have. They don't have the level of poverty that we have. They don't have housing crises, which we have in our major cities, which is you know, at the seat of homelessness. And what they have that we lack is universal health care. So we can import some of what they do, but if we don't have universal and preventative health care for people with serious mental illness and people who are impoverished, um, you know, there's always so much we could do. But there are some places that do it well. Look, I think that all across the country, you see really good centers, really good community mental health centers. Um, you see really good uh, assisted outpatient treatment programs. I mean, Summit County in, uh, in Ohio is a, is a great example. Uh, Reno, Nevada is a great example. Here in New York, we have mental health courts that divert people from you know, incarceration into treatment. There's a Queens mental health court, which is really quite brilliant, incredible, a Brooklyn mental health court that I'm intimately uh, knowledgeable about. So I think that we have some good resources in this country, but we don't have a kind of a unified strategy as they do more in Europe. And I think that we just have a attitude about mental illness and serious mental illness in particular, and about poverty and about homelessness, which um, really flies in the face of providing good care. Whereas I think the European countries, specifically Germany and the Scandinavian countries, you know, do a much better job than we do. 
Do you think we're getting there? Is the needle moving? Are we moving forward? Do you believe that we're better off today than we were five years ago and better off five years ago than 10 years ago? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think we are in some ways, but not in all ways. Uh, we're certainly better off because of the 2010 enacted parity bill, which enables people with mental illness to have care on the level of those with medical illness. Um, you know, there have been several acts that have passed since then that have been very instrumental uh, through legislature, both bipartisan, you know, legislature. I think in some ways it's not so good. So, for instance, when we talk about schizophrenia medication, new drug trials have decreased by, you know, something like 80 to 90 percent over the past 15 years. We have very fewer drugs in the pharmaceutical pipeline than we did 20 years ago um, for depression, but particularly for serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. We still rely on very old drugs, which are wonderful. You know, lithium is the gold standard, but it was discovered by serendipity in 1949. Alamictal and some of the mood stabilizers, anticonvulsants, you know, are very good, but you know, they were also used by serendipity. They were not, you know, engineered to deal with the causes of bipolar disorder. So I think that in terms of medication research, we really have a lot, uh, a, a lot that we really need to accomplish. We also have a first episode uh, psychosis emphasis in the NIH and SAMHSA, and that's great too. Uh, but I think we also need to deal with, you know, people who have been sick for a while. But the first episode, early intervention strategy, is a new strategy, and I think it's a very, very encouraging sign. What can families do to advocate for their loved ones? Because, it, it, you know, at the top of the show, we talked a little bit about there, there, there's barriers. You know, there, there's HIPAA, there's privacy, there's patients' rights. The, a lot of doctors, they, for a, any number of reasons, the most often given, uh, risk and, and legal assessment don't want to work with families. Now, NAMI, we, we, we have strong families that, that we're, we're working. We're, we're doing what we need to do, and we have a lot of barriers. Now, I, I don't want to get into a discussion about whether or not those barriers are good or bad. Just what can a family member do when they're advocating for their loved one and they're running up against all of the things, some of which documented in your movie and some of which you just know as a frontline advocate? Right. Hi, it's a big question. Look, I think yeah. the first thing people could do is, you know, what you're doing now, which is, you know, join NAMI and kind of, you know, organize and become activists. Um, uh, it's extremely important for families to tell their stories as hard as those stories are. And for those people who are still lost in stigma or shame, it's very, very important you know, to tell those stories. It was hard for me to tell my story. Frankly, it still is hard the story of my sister and her illness and of my family's denial of her illness. Um, but I think those stories are extremely powerful and important to tell and let everyone know that, you know, we're not going to kind of cower in the shadows anymore and, you know, be the beneficiaries of the kindness of strangers. You know, we're really going to demand better treatment um, and do what happened for HIV and happened for breast cancer, where people said, you know, enough is enough. We really need good research. And we really need better treatments. Um, you know, there's all kinds of uh, strategies for dealing with finding a loved one care. And I think we really, you know, I mean, that's a very complicated question. I deal with that every day of, you know, when people ask me, what do I do? Because my family member is seriously ill and I, I can't get them help and they won't go to a hospital. And, you know, and that's the world of assistant outpatient treatment and uh, mental health courts where people are arrested for a misdemeanor or felony offense and you want to divert them out of incarceration and the treatment. And that's also the world of guardianships and that sort of thing, which, you know, NAMI is expert at handling. But, you know, it's, this is, there's no way around it. The burden for taking care of people with serious mental illness falls on the family. That's wrong. It's so damn wrong. But that's where we're at today. And, um, you know, in the book, Bedlam, we provide some understanding of mental health courts, some understanding of assisted outpatient treatment. Uh, we also provide some understanding of psychiatric advanced directives in which you 
try to collaborate with someone when they're of sound mind so that if they, God forbid, become psychotic or manic, that they could more fully participate in their care, what they want and what they don't want. So, you know, these are what's at our disposal now. If you were king of the world, this is one of my favorite questions. Well, I am king of the world. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not? Oh, oh my God. Now you're telling me. No, nobody told you. <laughs> I, obviously, it's a hypothetical, but you know, Dr. Rosenberg, if you were, if you were king of the world and, and somebody walked up to you and said, all right, we want you and you alone to fix this. Now, don't, don't go too far. We're, we're trying to take action items out of this, but what are some things that you would suggest advocating for to make life better for people living with severe and persistent mental illness mm -hmm. other than dumping a big pile of money into things that are just not well funded at all. Yeah, I think I, that, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think that that's pretty easy for me, frankly. Um, I think the first thing is, you know, I want care to be better now. So I advocate for universal health care. And that in of itself would, you know, allow for a whole host of uh preventive problems low cost problems because you know now we're all in it now we're the taxpayers are paying the bill for everyone um so the emphasis would not be necessarily on acute very expensive acute care in hospitals and certainly the emphasis would not be on even more expensive care in jails and prisons the emphasis would be on prevention and community based community based treatment so the first thing would be advocating for preventative universal health care. And even if it's not for everyone universally, it should certainly be for those people who have serious mental illnesses. So they really need that kind of care. The second thing I would advocate is for more research. Dollars need to be put into research. That's really crucial. As I said, we've seen that with HIV, we've seen that with breast cancer, dollars need to be put into research because although the brain is very, very complicated, as it said, doesn't give up its secrets easily. There's a kind of a host of problems that contribute to serious mental illness, poverty among them. Still, at the end of the day, many of these are brain diseases and we need brain research or psychological research for better, better treatments. But I would say we definitely need better medications we have some good medications, but they cause some pretty bad side effects. We need better medications. Um, the third thing I would do is, you know, uh, really, uh, you know, divert people from incarceration to treatment. And I would really boost the system of mental health courts and assisted outpatient treatment. Uh, that one, none of these things would really cost more money because we just use the money differently. Uh, and diverting people from very expensive jail cells to less expensive community care would be important. And I think the fourth, and I would say one of the undervalued interventions is to deal with the drug epidemic. I mean, it's estimated that 80% of the homeless mental ill population deals with substance abuse as well as illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And as we all know, those of us on this call you can't really treat someone with serious mental illness if they're having a raging uh, substance abuse problem, if they're intoxicated. How are they going to get treatment? How are they going to get care? How are they going to realize they're sick? So I think that would be the fourth thing to really understand and appreciate that, you know, we need serious substance abuse treatment to deal with the substance abuse epidemic, which is a like throwing a grenade into a burning house if mental illness is the burning house substance abuse or the grenades. I think that a lot of viewers are going to be surprised to learn that the, I don't know if I want to use the word majority. So, so please, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but many of our mental illness, serious and persistent mental illness treatment staples were found accidentally. They I, yeah. I believe you use the word serendipitously. I, yeah. I think that there's there's this general belief that somebody is out there trying to resolve this problem and that's why the needle is moved versus not very many people are trying to solve the problem, but every now and again, the solu what they thought was the solution to another problem turns out not to work for that. But hey, <laughs> we, we, we've shown some 
huh, that's weird. And, and then suddenly we, we get a new drug. As a psychiatrist, and frankly, as a, as a, as a documentarian, as a, as a writer, as a journalist, it, can you educate folks about this? Because again, I, I, I love my NAMI family, but I really do think that they believe that there's a whole bunch of doctors sitting in a room trying to cure schizophrenia right now. And that's, yeah. that's just generally not the case. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sure there are a whole bunch of doctors trying to cure schizophrenia in a room somewhere, but you need many rooms and many institutes and, you know, much more funding to do so. Um, yeah. I mean, the history of psychopharmacology, which again, I'm a psychiatrist. I prescribe medications for my patients every day. I believe in this. But the history is not, you know, oh, we know what's wrong. We're going to fix it. The history is we're going to, we're going to look for something and then we'll find something else. It's a weird kind of uh, operation. So, you know, how this all started is they discovered that tuberculosis drugs might be good antidepressants. And then they developed the antidepressants in the 40s and 50s. They were looking for a new anesthesia and developed the antipsychotics, which enabled people to leave the asylums for the first time. But it was really, you know, the first antipsychotic, Thorazine, was discovered completely by accident, looking for a better anesthesia. Um, lithium was developed uh, by a, a, guy, a psychiatrist named Cade in Australia, completely by accident. He had this fococted idea that people with bipolar disorder have some kind of a urine acidity or base uh, something you know was wrong with the acid uh, 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 acidic nature of the urine. He was going to neutralize it uh, and therefore cure bipolar disorder. And he came up with this neutralization medication called lithium. The the theory was completely ridiculous, uh, but the medication endures as our gold standard from 1949. Probably wasn't until the 1990s or late 1980s that medications like uh, Prozac were developed with some intention and some understanding of the, of the basic neuroscience, but there hasn't been many breakthroughs. And in, in the mid 1980s, there was another drug developed, I think as an anesthetic called Clozaril, or many people know it as Clozapine, a wonderful drug for people with schizophrenia um, and far underutilized because of a, a, f a rare side effect of agranulocytosis, which is a white blood cell problem. Um, but that was also discovered by accident, and you know there hasn't been much done. Zyprexa was supposed to be the new Clozaril, but really didn't turn out to be that. And you know the whole new generation of antipsychotics developed, which were developed intentionally were still based on the old antipsychotics and they uh, didn't have some of the problems of the old antipsychotics. They didn't induce as much lethargy and they also um, didn't cause something called tardive dyskinesia as frequently. And tardive dyskinesia is the involuntary movements that were very common from the drugs of the 1950s, 60s. But the new drugs also cause new problems like metabolic syndrome which is a fancy name for kind of diabetes and, you know, grossly becoming overweight. Um, so, you know, there are women and men in rooms working hard on this problem every day, but there are very few candidate molecules. And, uh, you know, it's a chicken or egg question. Is that because we don't know enough about the brain or we just don't invest enough in knowing about the brain? But clearly, if you look at research for serious mental illness, it pales in comparison to something like uh, cardiovascular disease, pales in comparison to cancer. It's like, you know, a, a half a billion dollars compared to $5 billion for cancer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and if you look at the toll of mental illness, it is greater than the toll of all those other non-communicable diseases. If you add the cost burden of all the non-communicable diseases combined, cancer, cardiovascular disease, um, and you put the cost of that to our society in, on, on one side and mental illness on the other side, mental illness exceeds them, but we've spent a fraction of the money. So I think we need to spend more time and devotion. And uh, you know, I think it's, it kind of comes down, Gabe, to priorities. We don't prioritize serious mental illness and we don't prioritize treatment for people who have schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. 
and hopefully, you know, that time will come, but that time has not yet arrived. I hope that that time comes as well, just from a, 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 a money saving. I mean, just if, if you care about money, it's, it's, I think it's a good idea. But moving past that, I, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised that if you were king of the world, one of the things that you said was universal health care. I, I know that that's a loaded political topic, so just bear with me for a moment. I think a lot of people are unaware that our physical health exacerbates our mental health. Uh, for example, as, as somebody who lives with bipolar disorder, who's had psychosis, I, I think of when I was sick, some of the things that caused me the most problems uh, weren't bipolar disorder. It was the fact that I wasn't caring for myself very well. So I, I, I did have a, a substance abuse problem. But even moving past that, all of my food came from a bag. It came from McDonald's. I was, I, I wasn't, you know, no diet, no exercise, no routine, not good sleep. I wasn't getting good checkups. Uh, frankly, the only reason that my body survived is because I, I was very young. I was in, you know, I was in my, my late teens, early 20s. So I was able to overcome that because I finally got treatment. But I think about if I was an undiagnosed person with bipolar disorder today at 44, and I was eating nothing but grease, uh, not getting any exercise, staying up two or three days at a time. Uh, I think that would put me at prime risk for, uh, well, just many things. Is, is that why you feel that universal health care is, is a, a good deterrent for mental health issues? Because it would get caught early. Uh, all of those little things would get fixed before they became big problems, et cetera. Is, is that the logic? Yeah, well, I think the, I think the logic is that everyone would get health care. Everyone's mental health would be, you know, would be assessed and addressed early on. We would have early intervention for uh, psychosis as we do now as a part of a movement, but that would be part of just what you do. I mean, you know, we would, we would do it to save lives. We'd also do it to save money because we know it's much more efficient to treat any illness if you catch it earlier than later. And yes, we provide physical health as well as mental health care because they go hand in hand. You know, you can't, um, it's very, very hard to feel your best mentally when you're your worst physically and vice versa. So I think, yes, I think the universal health care, which means coverage for all people, you know, whether or not you have insurance, whether or not you're rich or poor, that everyone gets pretty decent care as they do in Europe, that I think would make us a much healthier country and certainly would help people at the lower end, you know, like people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. I think just to, I, you know, not, not to fall too far down a rabbit hole, but you know, the, the, uh, the average onset of, of these symptoms is what, like 16 to 24, uh, yes. you know, for like severe schizophrenia and, and bipolar disorder, psychosis, et cetera. And if you're supposed to get your health insurance from your employer, well, what, what kind of job are you working between the ages of 16 to 24 while you're also suffering from the symptoms of a very severe mental illness? Uh, which means it, if you don't come from a good family, because I, I know that's kind of the, oh, well, you'll get it from your parents. That is excellent if you have my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if you're an orphan? What happens if you don't have good parents? What if your parents also have mental illness and are underemployed or unemployed? I mean, there's just and what if you're in jail, as many people are, especially, you know, people of color now. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a real problem and you can't depend on that. But, you know, I think this, not, this uh, problem goes beyond rich and poor people. We all know very, very wealthy people who suffer serious mental illnesses with their children or loved ones do, and there's not much they can do about it. So, um, you know, I don't think there's a problem you could solve with money, which is why I always go back to the point that we need more research. You know, you might be rich enough to, to provide a good house for your child and, you know, the best doctors, but you, can, you can't invent medicines no matter how rich you are. Uh, that requires years of very expensive, you know, and very labor intensive research. Um, you can't, you could build a nice little cottage with a nurse and a doctor and a, you know, a physical therapist, but you can't build a hospital and you can't build a rehabilitation facility. That's right. beyond most anyone's capability, even if you're, you know, a billionaire. So um, I think that the most important issue that people need to recognize is that we're all in it together, and it's it doesn't really matter how rich you are or you know your 
yes, it's better to have money than, than not when you need medical care, but what we need to, to, to do as a nation is make this more of a priority as, as we've been talking about. I completely agree. Dr. Rosenberg, thank you so very much for your time. We really appreciate you. We only have about a minute left. Do you have any last words? No, but it's always good, great to be with NAMI. Seriously, I always feel at home. So thank oh, you for thank having you. me. Oh, you're very, very welcome. All right, listen up, everybody. Before we disconnect, please head over to NAMITN.org and sign up for our mailing list. And please check out the official Sundance selection from 2019, Bedlam at Bedlam Film dot com. We will see everybody next.